want to get go over as we are getting started. Um, I will be updating the board, um, but so that you know, um, I will be collecting your key issues packets at the end of class. So with like a minute before, if you'll just leave your key issues packet on your desk, um, I, will, I will be collecting those. Okay, so I will just take today to look over them, put the grades in RenWeb, and then you will get those back, all right? Second thing, your vocabulary is due on Wednesday. Wednesday, we will be taking part of the period to go over your vocabulary. Okay, so vocabulary is due Wednesday. Third thing is, and this will be updated on the board um, when you come in tomorrow, but your Chapter 9 FRQ, which is on your desk, is next Monday. Okay, if you want to just put that on that sheet of paper, next Monday is February the 1st. Can you believe it? Already in February. February the 1st, that's when your Chapter 9 FRQ is. All right, your Chapter 9 test, which that will also be up on the board tomorrow, your Chapter 9 test will be next Tuesday, okay, February the 2nd. <clears throat> that will be your chapter 9 test. And then we will be diving into uh, chapter 10 the back half of next week. We're in great position where we need to be. We just need to make sure that we continue making progress. Okay, the goal is mid-April. Mid-April, I keep saying that. But we want to be done with the course mid-April so we have those last two and a half, three weeks for review. That's really key. Okay, um, so we're going to go quickly this week as we go through this material. Um, what I need you to do is have your books open to page 301 as we go through our notes today. Um, we are... So, page 301, all right, page 301, um, <clears throat> and if you have a highlighter, I would suggest taking that highlighter out um, because the highlighter uh, would be important um, as we are going through things today. So, the way I'm going to do it is we're going to try to get through all of the issue one today. Um, and there are some charts, there are some graphs that I want you to highlight, to make little notes on. Um, okay, so um, we, will, we will do that together. The goal, again, is to get through the issue one today. If we can do more than that, that's great. First two things that I would like you to highlight uh, on page 301 is figure 9-2. It's on the bottom, uh, the Human Development Index, HDI, okay? Developed countries are those with very high development scores. The other classes are for developing countries. So you notice this is kind of like a, a green, a, a form of green, and you notice the very dark, the darkest colored greens represent what? Very high developed countries, yes. And the very lightest green represents what? Low development. Low development, okay. Now, a couple terms that I want you to kind of highlight or underline on page 300, the yellow page. I want you to underline the word development. Okay, on page 300, that yellow page, I want you to underline that word development. It's the process of improving the material conditions of people through diffusion of knowledge and technology. I also want you to underline where it says developed country or the um, 
letters MDC, more developed country. And then that next little paragraph, I want you to simply hide or underline the word developing country and LDC, the letters LDC. And that would be less developed country. So the big thing I want you to understand is development. That's what this chapter is about. Now, what do you think are words that could be related to development? What are words that you think could be related to development? Yeah. Growing. Okay, growing. Yep. What else? What are words that could be associated with the word development? Logan? Progress. Progress. Okay, progress. Yeah. Adding on. Okay, adding on. Yep. Um, building, being built, being developed. Okay, being built. Yep, these are ideas. Any specific words? Places and regions. Okay, places and regions. Yep. Parts of the world would be more developed than others. Would we agree? Parts of the world are going to be more developed than others. For example, the United States and Canada are going to be more developed than parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, right? Parts of Africa are going to be less developed than parts of North America and Europe. Parts of Asia are going to be less developed than Australia. Okay, so that, that's good. Um, how about the word money? How would money tie into development? How would money tie into development? This is really key to understanding. Steph? Would you have like money and how it's getting in letters to people like get higher stuff to make more borders and to get like countries more developing? Yeah. That's exactly right, Steph. The more money you have, means the more hospitals you can build, the more education opportunities you can offer your men and women in your country, the more medicine you can provide, the more jobs that you can provide. So being or living in a developed country is a huge benefit to its citizens. Because you, as a young person, 14, possibly 15 years old, sitting here now, the world literally is at your fingertips. You could do anything that you wanted to do. Now, you have to work hard in high school, you have to have a major in college, prepare for that, and then once you get through college, maybe go on to some extra schooling, and then you get into your job. But because of the United States of America is a developed country, not a developing country, our development, meaning the level of education, the level of resources that are at your fingertips, is greater than a teenager living in Cambodia or a teenager living in Sudan. Does that make sense? That's what this whole chapter development, that's what it's about. The money to be able to provide resources, whatever that is, money, education, technology, okay? Do you know that there are teenagers in Africa, in parts of South America and Asia, that have no idea what this is? If you were to show them this, they would be blown away. They would have no idea what this is. And yet all of us in this room use this every day and we don't think twice about it, do we? The level of development in the United States is so much greater that something like this, a cell phone, technology could be taken for granted. But someone living in a less developed or a developing country would be forever grateful to have something like that. So, it's, that's what we're diving into today, and, and really this whole week. So let's let's look at the first couple questions, okay? And let's talk about one and two, all right? 
Let's look at one and two. All right, we have some definitions here. Go ahead and highlight these. We kind of just went over these. These are basic definitions where we're starting the chapter. Okay, where we're starting the chapter. Development. Development is the process of improving the material conditions of people through diffusion and knowledge and technology. So that's all we're doing in development. We're trying to give you opportunity. When you come to ECS, we're trying to expose you to all kinds of different classes, all kinds of different clubs, all kinds of different activities, electives, so that when you leave ECS, something has sparked your interest. When you get to college, you say, you know what, I remember that when I was at ECS. I think I want to do that for my major. Okay? And, and so we're giving you the resources to be successful later on in life. More developed country, an MDC, make sure you highlight that. You need to know what an MDC is, a more developed country. That is a country that has progressed relatively far across the continuum of development. Now, figure 9-2, the Human Development Index, that is the continuum, okay? How many types of countries are on that continuum? Just by looking at figure 9.2, how many countries are on that continuum? Kat? Five. Okay, you have five if you include the no data. Right? If you don't include the no data, how many are there? Four? Yep, I see a couple of you going full number four. Yep, there are a total of four. So all countries in the world are somewhere in that continuum. That's what's called the HDI, the Human Development Index. Okay, and a lot of that has to do with the wealth of a country. All right, less developed country in LDC. That is, that is in the early stage of the process. So, for example, someone living in Ethiopia, do you think they're going to be as far along on the HDI as someone living in France? A lot of heads shaking, no, you are correct. Someone living in France is going to be, as a country, they're going to be farther along the Human Development Index in terms of development than someone living in Ethiopia. All right, number two, I want you to highlight this. All right, there are three things that determine the HDI, or the Human Development Index. Three things that determine this, okay? Number one, a decent standard of living. We're gonna talk about that, a decent standard of living. Now, you know what is really needed for a decent standard of living? A place to sleep and food and water, right? And, and a source of income to pay bills. That's really all you need. The size of a house doesn't matter. The type of car that one drives really doesn't matter. When it comes down to it at the end of the day, having a place to sleep, being able to have food and water, okay, and being able to pay your bills and take care of yourself is essential to the HDI index, Human Development Index. What about clothing for like keeping you warm? Well, that goes into bills. Clothing, groceries, things like that. Number two, a long and healthy life. Do all of you want that? I don't think there's not one person in here that says, you know what, I want to be sick and weak and die at 30. Okay, I, I doubt there's anybody in here that wakes up every morning and says, yeah, that's what I want. Okay, now I don't know if you want to live between 90 or 100, but you want to live a long and healthy life. That factors into, so access to medicine, access to doctors, things like that are number two. Tie into number two. And number three, access to knowledge. Access to knowledge. Those three, highlight those three, okay? Those are key in figuring the HDI. Very, very important. 
All right, let's look at the next questions. Okay? This is where I'll get, and I did add some things here, so you may want to add to this. All right, number three. Number three. What is the gross national income? Logan? The value of the output of goods and services produced in a country in a year, including money that leaves and enters the country. Okay, straight definition. I want you to highlight that. What does GNI stand for? Remember that. Circle those letters. GNI stands for gross national income. And in that definition, something that I want you to underline, you may have highlighted this, but I also want you to underline these words, including money that leaves and enters the country. Now, when we get to number seven, we're going to go back in our book, and I'm going to introduce another term to you called gross domestic product, or GDP. Okay, GDP is very important in figuring out the Human Development Index as well, but GDP is slightly different. Gross domestic product is slightly different than gross national income. So gross national income is all the money that the United States makes in one year, including what are goods called when they leave the U.S.? They're called exports. What are goods called when countries bring goods into the country? Imports. Imports. Now, when goods are coming into the country, does the U.S. make money or lose money? They lose money, right? Because they're paying another country for those goods. When goods leave the United States and they go to another country, does the U.S. make money or lose money? They make money. They make money. So with exports, the U.S. is always making money. With imports, and you may want to make a little note to yourself, with imports, the U.S. is always losing money. Okay? That's kind of a way to remember exports and imports. Any questions on that? Okay, Imports and exports are a big part of gross national income. Okay, Do you think all countries export and import the same? They don't do that. A country that would import and export more, chances are they are a more developed country or an MDC. Countries that import and export less products more than likely are going to be a LDC, less developed country or a developing country. That's how you can kind of tell the difference between the wealthy countries and the poor countries. All right, number five. Kat, would you have, oh, I'm sorry, number four. What is the annual per capita? Per capita simply means per person. GNI in an MDC in an LDC. Um, two people may be starting in developing countries with a per capita GNI of a few thousand dollars, and not everyone is wealthy in developing countries with per capita GNI of forty thousand. Okay. Yeah. Now I, I have a couple numbers here. All right. I said approximately thirty-four thousand. I also have a number here. It's some it, 47. It's somewhere in the low 40s. Okay, so it's it's right around 40,000 is the per person in a developed country that you could make. So if you take 47 and 34, you average those together, you're right at about 40,000. But I want you to notice the difference. The GNI per person per capita, by the way, that's just a fancy way of saying per person capita. In the financial realm, capita means person. Notice the difference in developing countries, how much lower that is. What's that difference? If you take 47 and 34 in a developed country, it's about 40,000, okay? In a developing or LDC, it's 7,000. What's the difference there per person? 40 minus 7. 
33, $33,000. Someone in a LDC is bringing in upwards of around $7,000 compared to, so you can see the level of living in an LDC on the HDI index is going to be a lot lower, isn't it? In, just to put this in context, in the United States, living below the poverty level is $20,000. For the entire year, if you make $20,000 or less, you're below the poverty level. Okay, you're in the lowest social class in the United States. And people in LDCs can bring in upwards of $7,000. So they're well below, aren't they? Okay, that puts it in context how poor many of these people in LDCs are and how low development is. All right, number five, explain the statement. Per capita, G&I measures mean wealth or average wealth, not the distribution. All right, I'm going to read this. I want you to update your questions as you need to. This statement is referring to that if only a few people receive much of the gross national income, then the standard of living for the majority may be lower than the average figure implies. A higher GNI, this is what I want you to highlight, okay? These last couple sentences. A higher GNI means more people can enjoy a good life. And this is where, again, you want to highlight this. This is the summary, okay? Some people have less wealth and live poorly, and others have more wealth and live comfortably. That's important. So if you look at a country and they have a high GNI, what does that tell you about the population as an average? Higher population. Say again? Are they a higher population? No, I mean, ta talking about economically. If you look at the GNI, the gross national income, and that number is higher, what does that tell you economically, financially, about that country? Stable. That it's stable. Okay, so if you have a number of 40,000 and higher, you know that country is doing very well. And that country, money wise, is very high on the HDI index, human development index. But if that GNI number is low, 10,000, 12,000, 15,000, then you know that that country has financial problems and they're going to be lower. On the human development index. So the GNI numbers are really important in trying to figure this out. Okay? The human development index. Alright, let's look at number six. You want to highlight this. Uh, Rachel, what do you have? What types of jobs comprise the primary sector of an economy, secondary sector, and tertiary sector? For a primary sector, I had jobs would be, for example, mining, fishing, and forestry. And for secondary sector, I put jobs that like manufacture goods. And for the last one, I put retailing, banking, law, education, and government. Good. Now, number six, there's a whole chapter on number six. We actually will get back to number six uh, in chapter 12. All right, but for the sake of this chapter, chapter nine, there are different types of jobs that people can get within an economy, okay? Those types of jobs help to define where a country will be in the Human Development Index. For example, if you have less jobs to offer people, chances are that country is going to be an LDC. If you have more jobs to offer people, there's a good chance your country is an MDC. Okay? Whether you want to have a job in banking, education, or government job, or want to, you know, I don't know, be in agriculture, um, tertiary, a lot of people will go into retail. Okay, some of you, your first job may be a waiter or waitress, or you may work at a golf course, you know, or retail, some retail store. Um, a lot of my students over the years have got jobs in retail. Okay, good hours, you make good money. Um, you know, these are jobs that are available in MDCs, not as much in LDCs. Number seven, 
What is the percent of workers in agriculture different in LDCs and MDCs? Sarah? In LDCs, more people work in agriculture than in MDCs. Very good. Okay, go ahead and flip, flip the page. Um, I want you to highlight uh, on page 302 a couple things. I want you to highlight purchasing power parity PPP right there in the middle of the page. And then just highlight the definition right after it. Purchasing power parity is an adjustment made to the GNI to account for differences among countries in the cost of goods. Right below uh, that, in the next paragraph, I want you to highlight where it says gross domestic product, GDP. See GDP there? And the definition is right after that, if you would highlight that, which also is the value of output of goods and services produced in a country in a year. But, there's the key word, it does not account for money that leaves and enters the country. So how is GDP different than GNI? GDP only focuses on the money inside a country. Gross, gross national income focuses on money inside and money outside. Okay, GDP is at the very bottom of page 302. All right, if you would highlight figure 9-4 and 9-6 as well. Those two maps are very important to our understanding as well. So let me back up real quick. Somebody tell me, what's the difference between gross national income and gross domestic product? I want to make sure we, we understand that. The difference between gross national income and gross domestic product. Just money, gross domestic product is just focusing on money we spend within the country in a given year. Perfect. That's excellent. Okay. Let's look at 8 through 12. Okay. Let's look at 8 through 12. All right. So number eight, within MDCs, what is the trend increasing or decreasing for each of the sectors? All right, I'll read. You want to read it, Logan? Sure. Um, in uh, MDCs, primary and secondary are decreasing, and tertiary is increasing. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I had. So, in in um, developed countries, the primary sector uh, is increasing. Um, Secondary, it's, it's decreasing in developing and developed. Did you have in primary, it's decreasing in developed countries, but it's increasing in um, developed? Did you have that? If you didn't, you need to update that. And then how about tertiary? The trend in the tertiary sector is increasing in developed countries. So primary and tertiary, it's actually increasing in developed countries, meaning there's more jobs. But what do you notice about developing countries? What is it doing across the board? What are jobs doing across the board, increasing or decreasing? In developing, decreasing. In poorer countries, jobs are decreasing across the board. Okay, so what that does is if you're running track and you start out at the starting line, are you even with that person beside you? When the gun sounds, or the judge or whoever says, counts down and you start running, and you're side by side with that person, at the very end they pull ahead and they beat you by three lengths, okay? That's what's happening in the world, all right? All of, our, all of the world countries are runners. 
some countries are way out ahead economically because they have more money, they have more resources. Other countries, as we go along, they get slower and slower. So what's happening is the countries that have money are zooming ahead, the countries that don't have to pull back, and you have this big gap, okay? You have this big gap between countries, which is not good, okay? Not good for, for the country. Number nine, productivity uh, and value added. A couple of vocabulary words, go ahead and highlight these. I'll touch on these real quick. Productivity is the value of a particular product compared to the amount of labor needed to make it. So, how many of you have ever made something? What's something that you've made with your hands? Something that you've made. James? A pillow. You've made a pillow. Okay. All right. So, Productivity says the value of that particular product compared to the amount of labor to make it. So that pillow, when it was finished, how much do you think it was worth? Probably about 10 bucks. Okay, probably about 10 bucks. Um, how much labor did you put into it? About an hour or two. Okay, so if you were making that pillow for somebody, more than likely, your time is also money, isn't it? So you probably would want to charge somebody for your time as well. Do you know that when you get older, students, this is an economics lesson. Mr. Keeper will touch on this your senior year, but I'll give it to you for free now, okay? Because it's really important. If you're living in a condo or an apartment or something 20 years from now, okay, you'll be 34, 35 years old, you're on your own, you may have a roommate, you're married, something, you have a job, live in life, life is good. Let's say all of a sudden, your refrigerator breaks, or your dishwasher breaks, or your toilet busts, okay? You have to have somebody come out to fix it. Do you know they're come, when they come out to fix it, they're actually charging you for two things. They're charging you for the actual part to fix the appliance that's broken, but they're also charging you for their time, the labor, okay? That principle is productivity. They're charging you for the labor to fix it, and they're charging you for the part. Now look at this, value added. Value added is the gross value of the product minus the cost of raw materials and energy. This is the other part of the equation, isn't it? So that same toilet breaks, you can't flush it, you have one toilet in the house for two people, you're like, we gotta get this fixed now, Okay, because I'm not gonna stop having to go to the bathroom. So you have someone come out, they're charging you productivity for the time of their labor, but they're also charging you value added for the piece to fix the toilet. Or if you have to replace the whole toilet, put in a new toilet, okay, that's the value added. Does that make sense? Both of those pieces are very, very important within development. All right, number 10. Peyton, what do you have here? What three consumer goods are considered to be particularly good indicators of development? They are cars, computers, and telephones. Good, yes. Who has a car, right? Who has a cell phone, right? Who has a computer, right? All of those things. Do you know there are people in the world that don't have cars? You know what they ride? They ride bicycles, or they walk. They don't know what a cell phone is. They have never seen a computer. Wouldn't it be amazing if you ran into somebody around the world and you showed them your computer or you showed them your cell phone? It'd be like a kid in a candy store or a kid on Christmas morning getting a gift, something they really wanted. It, a lot of people don't know what these things are. Those are good indicators of development where a country is, an NBC or an LBC. Number 11, James, what's the ratio of people to these type goods in typical NBC? Okay, so for cars, I said it was uh, for, I believe it was more developed countries, it was 630 out of 1,000, and for internet, it was 700 out of 1,000, and telephones, 1,100 out of 1,000. Then for least developed countries, it was, for cars, it was 80 out of 1,000, for the internet, it is 200 out of 100, or 1,000. 
and total points, it was 700 out of 1,000. Those numbers, I want you to put a star by that question because that should clearly indicate to you numbers don't lie. Numbers are facts, okay? Opinions can have bias, but facts are in numbers. This clearly shows you where development comes in. Poorer countries cannot afford the volume of cars, computers, and cell phones. I had a, uh, and I know this isn't one of them, but I had a student in the past couple of years, in their house alone, they had six cell phones. They had five computers. They had seven TVs. And they had four cars. Okay, now, that's pretty good. Okay, a lot of places in the world, you're not going to see that volume. That's a clear sign of the level of development in this country. People can do that in this country. Okay, other places in the world, you're not going to see that. All right, number 12, step, what you have here? The people in LDCs who do have access to consumer goods are usually concentrated in what regions? Yes, go ahead and highlight that. Where are they concentrated in urban areas? Why do you think in LDCs, why are they focused in urban areas? It makes sense, it should, but why people that have wealth in these poor countries, why are they centered in the cities? Rachel? Because that's where more jobs and work typically are. Exactly. Everybody in poor countries goes to the cities. And you know what they do with the money they make? They send it back to the rural areas where their family lives. I don't know if you've been following the news, but there is a huge migrant caravan that is currently making its way to the United States. We're talking to over 10,000 people. It started in Honduras. It's making its way. It's not to Mexico yet, but the goal is to make their way up through Mexico, eventually to get the United States border, and potentially a uh, Biden presidency may consider letting them in. 10,000 people. Now, I'm not going to get into the, the political and legal ramifications of that. That's for another day, if you're interested. But the, why do I bring that up? Because as I've been reading, as I've been following this in my personal time, a lot of these migrants in this caravan that are coming up are men. Now, we've talked about migration before, but many of these people that are coming are men. Why is that? The Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Want to work for their families and have like good livelihoods. Yeah. They've actually interviewed dozens of these men that are sleeping on the side of the road, that are sleeping in makeshift shelters that have been prepared, prepared by these small Central American countries. The number one reason why they're coming is because their country is poor. There's nothing for them there. They want to get to America to get a job, to make money, and send that money back. That's the number one reason why they're coming. So development. Places in Central America we see are extremely poor, don't have hardly anything. These men are willing to risk everything to try to get to America. Whether they get in remains to be seen. Can't say yes or no. It's kind of 50-50 up in the air at this point. But nevertheless, they're coming because they're hoping they can get into America, they can make money, and send that money back to their family. And that has to do with development. All right, looking at 13, 14, and 15, um, life expectancy in MDCs to LDCs. Sarah, you want to take that one? What's life expectancy? Life expectancy in MDCs is a little higher than in your LDCs, which is 68. Okay, yeah. So, um, more developed or MDCs, you're about 80 years old. Life expectancy in an LDC, around 68. So you see the difference. And if you factor on that, in more developed countries, women tend to live even longer than that. Okay, I've seen 
numbers that go as high as 86 or 87 years old life expectancy in in the disease but that is if you don't smoke if you're not a drinker if you exercise you're not obese things like that if you take care of yourself your life expectancy goes way up there's no family issue of cancer, things like that, life expectancy goes way up. Number 14, compare infant mortality rate in MDCs to LDCs. Jackson? In LDCs, about 94% of infants survive and 6% of infants die. And in MDCs, about 99% live and 1% die. Yeah, so what's that tell you about babies dying? Those are a lot of stats there, but what is that short of it? What's that telling you? What it should, yeah, Sarah? Um, MDCs have more access to health care, and like if any accidents go wrong, they get health care, and then LDCs don't. Yeah, you know, here's the thing. How many of you have known somebody, and this is so sad, but you've known somebody that they've given birth to a baby that's premature? Have you known somebody or they've given birth to a baby that's premature? Medicine is so incredible, they can save hundred percent of those babies. Now unfortunately some premature babies may pass away due to health complications, but medicine in the United States of America is incredible. Giving, being a, a husband and wife and giving birth to your first child, your second child, your third child, your fourth child is a pretty incredible thing to do in the United States of America because the infant mortality rate is going to be a lot lower than if you're giving birth to a child or Niger, okay, or Mauritania in Africa. It's going to be a lot lower. All right, number 15, um, a couple questions here, and then we'll move on. Um, what do we have, the quality of education, define and explain both. Make sure you update this on number 15, pupil to teacher ratio. That's you and I. You're the pupils, I'm the teacher. Notice we have a very low ratio. What's our ratio? How many kids do we have in the class? Eight. 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 Nine. Yeah, well, right now we have eight, but we're counting ginger. So we have nine. Nine pupils to one teacher. That's really good ratio because that means I can work with each of you if you ever needed it one-on-one -on -one a lot more easier than if I had 25 kids in here. All right, so the number of pupils in a classroom as compared to the number of teachers in a classroom. So you might want to put beside this nine to one. Okay, that is our pupil to teacher ratio, nine to one. The fewer students a teacher has, the more effective that teacher can be. Typically in developing countries, there are more students in classrooms per teacher because there's not as many schools. Developed countries, schools like to tell their constituency we have smaller class sizes because in developed countries there are more schools. All right, literacy rate, what's that talking about? Well, the ability to read and write. The percentage of people that can read and write in a country or region, the higher number of people in developed countries can attend school and learn to read and write. So are literacy rates gonna be lower in LDCs? 100% yes, because there's not as many schools available. Listen, if you are a young person, 14, 15 years old, and you're living in Angola, Africa, you get up in the morning, you're not worried about school. You're worried about going out in the field with your mom and dad and getting enough crops for the day so that you can have dinner tonight so that you can live. Think about that for a second in your day. Every day you get up with the will to live that day. You're not even thinking about school. So the ability to read and write, that doesn't even go into your brain at any point. You're not thinking about that. You're just thinking about surviving and living. All right, so literacy rate, it's gonna be different. That's a part of development, okay? Last. Last three here. This is where we're going to stop so we can get the key issue to tomorrow. What is the literacy rate in MDCs and LDCs? Peyton? I think they, 
Missouri State is 99% NBCs and LDCs and 90%. Yeah, so there is one note though, isn't there? Hopefully you got that 99% literacy rate in NBCs, about 90% in most LDCs, but did you make a note? It goes down to 70% in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. What are countries in South Asia? That would include India, but what are other countries? Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal. Okay, these are very, very poor countries. Very poor countries. All right, stay with me. Number 17. Logan, what do you have here? Give examples in regions where there are variations in levels of development. Explain why. Uh, there's variations in Southeast Asia and North Africa and due to rise in the supply of oil. Okay, yeah, so variations in level of development are high. Southwest Asia, North Africa, Central Asia, as well as Brazil, China. I said Brazil twice. Um, but why is that? Well, Southwest Asia, North Africa, has an abundance of oil. Oil is very, very pricey. And so countries that have oil make billions of dollars. Billions, not millions, billions every year. Oil, everybody needs oil. Because oil is the basis for what? Gas. And we haven't made energy, well we have, but we haven't made cars that fly, we haven't made cars that can operate wide scale from gas. So gas is needed. So countries that have oil are gonna be a little higher on the HDI than countries that don't have an abundance of oil. Last question for today, give examples of countries with varying levels of development. Underline these three examples. Okay, stay with me, we got over three minutes. Brazil, where is it wealthiest? Well, Brazil is very interesting. We'll look at this tomorrow before we get into key issue two. But in Brazil, it's wealthiest along the coast. Why do you think that is? Big cities. Yeah, big cities are on the coast. It's poorer as you get in toward the rainforest. You know the beautiful Amazon rainforest? Guess where that is? in the interior. So it's going to be poorer in Brazil. Look at China. China, the wealth is the greatest along the coast. Same thing. As you go into the interior of China, what does the development do? It goes down because it's mostly agricultural. With agricultural, you're not going to make as much money as the industry and the manufacturing and trade along the coast. And finally, in Mexico, where is wealth concentrated? This is interesting. Along the United States border and in the tourist spot of the Yucatan. Now, cruise ships I don't think have been going out for quite a while. I don't even know if they're gonna go out in 2021, but probably by 2022, we'll start having cruises that go to the Yucatan. Have you heard of Cancun or Cozumel? Those hot spots that you can go on cruises? Guess what? Tourists love those places. They love it. And the Yucatan loves those tourists back because they take their tourist dollars and it's a big deal for the Mexican economy. But if you look at the interior parts of Mexico, that's where it's poorest because they don't get the tourists, they don't get the business like the coasts and the Yucatan. Now, one exception to that is Mexico City. Mexico City is not near the coast. It's not on the Yucatan. It's right in the center of the country. But yet, Mexico City does very well economically. Their development is up. But overall, Mexico is lower on the HDI index than the United States because they have more poor regions. Okay, that concludes today. Just keep your packet on your desk. Make sure your name is on it. I will be looking over the issues two, three, and four, that you have complete sentences, that you've completed everything and I will give those packets back to you tomorrow. Those will be on your desk. We will cover key issue two tomorrow. It's not as long, but it's only 12 questions. 
and May enrollment start in TSU three. Right? They are two separate homework grades. Yep. Bell rings. You are. Yep. Um, bell rings. You're free to go. Well, thank you. Just leave it on your desk, and I will come get your paper that you have, James. I'll just leave that there. Okay.